We've been digging deep into three foundational concepts to Christianity, mercy, grace, and favor. And this is part three in this teaching series. So far, we've learned that almost everywhere you see the English word mercy in your Bible, the underlying Hebrew or Greek word actually means compassion or empathy. And this is going to be a big change in my vocabulary. You know, I'm used to praying prayers that address most merciful God. Or I pray that God will have mercy on us, like my Bible says. And now I know to pray to the most compassionate God, who shows us compassion and empathy. Last time we got technical about some word meanings. We realized that our modern usage of the word mercy implies that penalty has been reduced or eliminated, but the person we're having mercy on is still a convict. They still have on their record the fact that they committed a crime. Maybe they're not getting punished for that crime, just like someone who is pardoned or somebody whose sentence is commuted, but they're still convicted. They're still guilty. They're just not getting punished, that's all. Unfortunately, many Christians think mercy describes what God does for us. But what God does for us, man, it is way better than mercy or pardon. What God does for us is He allows Jesus to take on Himself all of our guilt, all of our sin, and then when He paid the price for that sin, He paid the price as if He had been the one who had committed that sin. The charge for our sin no longer has our name on the ledger. The court records show that the person convicted of that sin was Jesus Himself, not us. Jesus was our substitute. And in doing that, Jesus left us in a most wonderful place. He has left us Christians innocent, not guilty, righteous, holy, worthy. He did that at no charge to us. He did that as a free gift. He did that as grace. I think that this teaching on mercy is the most important teaching I've done in a long time because it makes it so clear that with Jesus living in us, we carry no guilt for any sin. Yes, I know we sometimes sin. We need to repent. We got to ask forgiveness. But when we do that, all we're doing is we're applying the substitutionary work of Jesus on the cross. That sin that we just repented of and gained forgiveness from, that sin had actually already been covered by Jesus on the cross. He had already taken it upon himself. He took on the guilt. He took on the penalty of that sin. When we repented and asked for forgiveness, all we're doing is making sure that that sin got moved over from our account to the account of Jesus. The process leaves us innocent. It leaves us free from any guilt and free from any condemnation. But most Christians live their lives under a cloud of guilt. They beat themselves up over and over again for their failures. They ask for forgiveness over and over again for the same sin. When Christians do that, that tells me clearly that they don't understand what Jesus did for them. They're still thinking that God had mercy on them or pardoned them. No, God had mercy on Jesus and pardoned him and left you absolutely, totally innocent. When you beat yourself up over and over for a past sin, or when you ask for forgiveness over and over for the same sin, listen to me. When you do that, you're shaking your fist in God's face. And you're telling God, I don't care what Jesus had to suffer through on the cross. I don't care how much pain He endured on my behalf. I don't care what He suffered to take away my guilt and my condemnation. I'd rather sit here and wallow in my pity and guilt. And oh, by the way, God, I don't really want any of that free grace stuff. I'm too busy being self-centered and elevating myself above Jesus. You can just keep your grace. I'm too busy earning my salvation with my suffering through condemnation. 
Wow, you say, Father Dan, that's pretty harsh. No, that's true. When we refuse to accept our innocence and freedom from condemnation, we're openly crucifying Jesus all over again. Think about it for a minute with me. Imagine that you spent days finding the perfect birthday present for your child or your grandchild. They're about six years old. Imagine that with me. You spent a lot of money on that gift, probably more than you should have. But that big day comes and you bring them their gift. Man, you're anticipating joy when they see what it is. But when they open your gift, they sneer at it. And they say, big deal, who cares? And they toss the gift to the side, never look at it again. How would that make you feel? Just let those feelings of disappointment and rejection wash over you for a minute. Listen, that's how Jesus feels when you refuse to accept the innocence that he freely gives you. Imagine with me as we hear Jesus say something like this. I went to a lot of trouble to say the least, on the cross, so that I could give you the free gift of innocence. And you're going to reject me and what I did for you? It hurts my feelings to watch you suffer in guilt and condemnation, especially considering all I did to make that pain and suffering go away. How self-centered and inconsiderate of us to reject the grace of forgiveness and innocence that is freely offered to us by God. If you've missed these first two teachings in this series on mercy, or you're still struggling with condemnation, please go to our YouTube channel, Three Streams TV, and look for the last two videos entitled Mercy, Grace, and Favor 1 and 2. Watch both videos or listen to them like you would a podcast. Carry them with you. Listen to them again and again until this truth settles down into your spirit. And even then, you may need to get somebody to pray with you for inner healing, healing of memories, deliverance, that sort of thing. Listen, if you're going through life carrying guilt, feelings, carrying a load of condemnation for something that you did, I mean, you know, you know you did it. That condemnation that you're feeling, it's not coming from God. Because He went to a lot of trouble to make you innocent. He went to a lot of trouble to take away your guilt. If you're still feeling guilty, then you need either inner healing so that you can stop condemning yourself, or maybe you need to drive away any demonic lying spirits because the devil loves to condemn us. He just does that all the time. We've got to stop him. If you're feeling guilt and condemnation, let us pray for you. We don't receive mercy from God. We receive compassion and empathy, which brings us to grace. Last time we opened the investigation into grace with the secular definition, with the modern definition, also usage of grace. And then we kind of started into the Old Testament use of grace, and we discovered that technically there is no Hebrew word for grace. So let's dive into the Old Testament and look for grace, okay? What about the words in the original Bible, Old Testament and New Testament translated grace? What do they mean? Well, let's start with the Old Testament. The English word grace shows up eight times in my translation. That's the New American Standard. But the King James, it translates grace or gracious almost 70 times. Hmm, that's interesting. What's up with the difference in translation? Well, we're going to dig into understanding that in a minute. But this difference highlights one of the difficulties that folks have translating Hebrew to English. See, the problem is that Hebrew is a very concrete language with few abstractions. Grace and favor, those are abstract concepts. Hebrew tries to illustrate the abstract through pictures. Hebrew letters and words are almost pictograms. They're trying to illustrate a feeling more than a concept. Grace and favor in the Old Testament are concepts that are almost synonymous, but they're not described with abstract words like grace and favor. No, they paint a picture that makes you feel grace or favor. Let me try to explain. 
The Hebrew word translated grace in my translation is the word chen, C-H-E-N. It paints a picture of a family camp where the tents have been pitched in a circle. That way it acts like a barrier or protection against the outside. Hmm, how in the world could that mean grace or favor? Well, to an ancient Hebrew, this word meant lots of things, including favor or graciousness or beauty. They would see that circle of tents as something that's beautiful. They thought of it as a place of healing, a place of help, refuge, rescue. The idea is you get protection and healing and help when you're inside the camp. So to the ancient Hebrew, the camp was a precious place, a beautiful, gracious place where you could find grace and favor. The Hebrew word chin has a much richer meaning than just grace. We say grace is unmerited favor, but it does describe a concrete situation, not an abstract concept. How the word is translated really depends on the translation you use. In my translation, the New American Standard, for instance, chin is usually translated into the English word as favor, and sometimes is translated as grace. But in the King James Version, chin is translated just the opposite. It's usually translated as grace, and sometimes it's translated as favor. Well, whichever translation you use, whenever you see the English words grace and favor in the Old Testament, you can pretty much be sure that they come from this Hebrew word chin, which literally means a camp made of a circle of tents that would make you feel grace or favor. Before we get to examples, let's clear one little detail, okay? Notice that I kind of use grace and favor interchangeably. When we get to the word favor, you're going to see that that's perfectly okay. After all, the simple definition of grace is God's unmerited favor, right? And the simple definition of favor is someone receiving something of value that they didn't necessarily earn or deserve. That is, favor they received as a grace. So, to me, it's okay to use these words interchangeably. Now, let me give you a couple of examples where chin is used, okay? Turn, first of all, to Genesis 6, verse 8. Genesis 6, verse 8 says, But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found chin in the eyes of Yahweh. To the ancient Hebrew, reading this, it might make them think that for Noah, being around God was like being in a family camp. It was all safe. He was accepted there. Genesis 39, 4. Genesis 39, 4. The story of Joseph. So Joseph found favor in his sight, Potiphar's sight, and became his personal servant. Joseph found chin in the sight of Potiphar. The English word favor here is chin, indicating that it was like Joseph had been brought into the family camp of Potiphar himself. You see what I mean? The Hebrew word doesn't specifically say Joseph found favor, but it paints a picture that makes you feel like what Joseph might have felt if he'd been invited into Potiphar's home camp. How about Psalm 84, 11? Psalms 84 in verse 11. For Yahweh is a sun and shield. Yahweh gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Yahweh gives grace and glory like the sun and withholds no good things from those who walk uprightly. The English word grace here comes from that Hebrew word chin. What God gives us makes us feel warm and fuzzy like going into the protected family camp. A sun and a shield is even more protection than a family camp. But God doesn't withhold from us His grace. He gives us this good stuff. He gives it freely. This verse fits so well with our modern understanding of God's grace. It's something wonderful that is poured out on us by God. 
there's no specific mention here of unmerited favor, but this whole psalm is about how God blesses those whose hearts are turned toward the Lord. God's blessings are, I think, usually unmerited. We don't earn them, right? How about Proverbs 3.34? Proverbs 3 and verse 34 Though he scoffs at the scoffers, yet he gives grace to the afflicted. God gives grace, or chin here, to the afflicted. And this lines up so well with our word grace, because it would mean that God has brought the afflicted into a gracious place of protection and refuge. And I can't see how, if he did that, it would be because the afflicted person somehow earned it. No, it would be unmerited favor. It would fit well with our modern definition of grace. So maybe the concept of grace is not specifically spelled out in the Old Testament as a single word, as clearly as it is in the New Testament. But we certainly see God's unmerited favor, God's grace, demonstrated all over the Old Testament. I mean, think about it a minute. God choosing Abraham's family as his nation. Well, Abraham certainly never did anything to earn that. <laughs> he even lied about his wife because he didn't think God was big enough to protect him. But God still gave Abraham grace and pronounced him righteous. How about when God gave Israel a land that they didn't deserve and that they didn't earn? God healed Nahum, the leper, not because Nahum had done anything special to deserve it, but because God seems to love to pour out his grace on undeserving humans. I mean, sometimes we use the label divine providence to describe things that happen in the Old Testament, God taking care of something. But divine providence is just grace directed at provision or protection. So there's a lot of grace shown in the Old Testament. It's just not always labeled as that. What about grace in the New Testament? We see the word grace or gracious about 120 times in the English New Testament. In the New Testament, the Greek word translated grace is usually charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. Charis is gracious in action and manner. It can mean charm. It can mean a kindness or favor that results in a free gift. The Greek word charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, is usually translated as grace, but it's also translated as favor, thanks, thankfulness, and sometimes even credit. Charis is actually the root of our English word for charity. And charity has come to be synonymous with giving alms to people in need, especially people who cannot provide for themselves or giving to those who can't repay. That's how we usually think of charity, right? Charity is a free gift. If they had to do something to earn it, <laughs> then it's wages. It's not charity anymore, right? Same with grace. It's free. By the way, the Latin word gratis seems to come from this Greek word cherish. And for us, gratis means something that's free. Well, that really describes how the word grace is used in the New Testament. It refers to something that we receive that we did not deserve, we did not earn, we could not earn, we could never pay for. When one of our grandchildren has a birthday and we give them a gift, did that gift cost them anything? I hope not. All they did to deserve that gift was be our grandchild and live another year, right? The Amplified Bible describes grace as God's unmerited favor. Unmerited simply means that I didn't deserve it and didn't earn it. The simple definition of grace is free stuff. <laughs> free stuff that you could never earn or deserve. To me, this is one of the best scriptures, I think, that describes grace. Turn to Romans 4, verse 3. Romans 4, verse 3 reads, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Paul is actually quoting from the Old Testament here. Turn with me to Genesis 15 and verse 6. Genesis 15 
in verse 6 says, and this is the God of the Old Testament, right? Then he believed in the Lord. He, Abraham, believed in Yahweh, and he, Yahweh, reckoned it to him as righteousness. He believed Yahweh, and that counted, made God say, Abraham is now righteous. Well, that's grace. <laughs> we believe that what God says is true, and then God, for free, declares us righteous. Here's another good illustration of grace. Luke 23, 39 through 43. Luke 23, starting in verse 39. The scene is the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save us and yourself. But the other answered and rebuking him, said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed, we're suffering justly, for we're receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross next to Jesus Best we can tell, this guy didn't serve God a day in his life. But all he had to do was call on the name of Jesus, believe in Jesus. And he was assured heaven just as much as Abraham was. That was grace. So in the New Testament, the Greek word cherish denotes something free that God gives us. That's nothing unexpected in the words themselves, okay? But what does this really mean to receive grace from God? What does it really mean that we're saved by grace? Turn to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no man may boast. We're saved by grace, and that is a gift of God. Grace equals gift. Okay, that lines up, right? Verse 9 says that this is something we could never earn. Well, there can be no clearer definition of what it means to be saved by grace. You can't earn it. God gives it to you for free. Like the thief on the cross next to Jesus, all I have to do is believe on Jesus as my Lord. And I imagine in my mind that as I'm believing on Jesus, that it initiates in heaven a cascade of events. Let me describe that to you, okay? First of all, I think Jesus wraps his arms around me and says, Welcome home, long lost brother. <laughs> because at that point, I am the adopted brother of Jesus. And then Jesus goes to the courts of heaven, and he takes my name with him, and there he tells the judge to go to the records of sin and do two things. First of all, everywhere my name is associated with sin, substitute the name of Jesus in place of my name. And then number two, every sin that had been charged to Dan Whit, Jesus tells the judge to wipe it out. Remove it from the legal record because Jesus paid the ultimate price for that sin on the cross. Then the Lord Jesus picks up the Lamb's Book of Life and he writes, Dan Whit in the Lamb's Book of Life. And all the time this is going on, you can almost hear the devil, the accuser. He's screaming and hollering. It's not fair. You can't do that. Dan committed those sins. We all know it. And he deserves to die for those sins. It's written that the wages, the justly deserved punishment for sin is death. And this is what I imagine my heavenly daddy saying to the devil. You're right. It's not fair. I didn't send Jesus to be a substitute for Dan's sin because Dan deserved it or did anything to earn it. I did it because I can <laughs> and because I wanted to. I did it for my own sake. Turn to Isaiah 43:25. Isaiah 43:25 or Isaiah if you like. I, even I, this is God talking, I am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not 
remember your sins. Yahweh wipes out our transgressions for his own sake. In this verse to me, it's like God saying, I want to wipe out the sins of every human being. I want to offer it to them as a free gift so that nobody can ever say they earned it. And I'm offering this free gift to every human being because I want to. Whether or not any of them ever receive it, whether any of them ever take me up on my offer, I'm making the offer anyhow because I want to, says Yahweh. As I was preparing this teaching, it was overwhelming to think about God's compassion and love for us. God doing all this salvation by grace stuff because He wants to. Not because He's looking for some kind of repayment for me. Not because I'll be obliged to Him in any way. It wouldn't be grace then, would it? God says, this is what I want to do. Now you do whatever it is you want to do with that. But I hope it's accepting what Jesus did on the cross for you. Turn to Acts 15, 7 through 11. Acts 15, 7 through 11. Let's look at a story that shows us that grace was in the minds of the earliest disciples. They knew we were saved by grace. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just like he did with us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they are. Peter here is speaking to the congregation in Jerusalem. What they're doing is they're talking about the influx that they were seeing in the Gentiles, you know, coming into the church. And this new church there at Jerusalem had a group of Pharisees. They'd become Christians. They were believers in Jesus. But they thought that these new converts, these Gentiles, they ought to have to follow all the Jewish law, the Torah. But Peter in verse 7 and 8 reminds them about what happened at the house of Cornelius, how a bunch of Gentiles got saved, and they knew for sure that the Gentiles had gotten saved because they got baptized in the Holy Spirit and they were speaking in tongues. Well, look at verse 9. God made no distinction between Jew and Gentile, but cleansed the heart of both peoples by their believing in Jesus. Notice the word cleansed. As we learned earlier, God doesn't cover our sin. Or He doesn't just pardon us from the punishment of our sin. No, God literally and completely washes it away and then forgets it ever happened. I love what Peter said in verse 10. Look guys, we're living proof that nobody can follow the law on their own. What an awful burden that would be to put on the Gentiles. You can't ask them to obtain salvation through their own works because we know that's impossible. That's when Peter makes sure that they remember where salvation really comes from. And in verse 11, he says, It is through the grace of Jesus. It is a free gift. It can't be earned. It can't be deserved. It can't ever be paid for. Peter said that the Gentiles got the free gift just like the Jews did. So why in the world would we want to put a price on this free gift? That's such a great illustration of grace. Well, we will pick up next time on some of the benefits of God's grace. Tune in then to see where this goes.